Florence and the Machine have a new CD out. Nice. Do they make CDs still? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> a new album. And I love that. This is one of the new songs. And I'm also glad because that means... Hopefully she'll be back to town. Yep. <laughs> Last time she was here, I mean, my goodness, love her. And so happy that she's going to be showing up possibly here in St. Louis. Speaking of showing up here in St. Louis, check it out. It's Senator Roy Blunt. How you doing, buddy? Well, I'm glad to be here. I, I'm trying to think of the last time I heard anybody use the word album. <laughs> <laughs> or is this the whole world you live in where you want to know they still make CDs yeah, or right. not? It's, uh, it's amazing. I saw something the other day um, where um, they think that, like, the technology of to just the IT technology will increase by a trillion times in the next decade or so. Oh, wow. And that same thing said that the all the computing power to send the person to the moon is available now on any combination of two Nintendo games. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> or your smartphone yeah, has, mm -hmm. like, all the technology that would have been in the world in, you know, 30 years ago. Right on. In one smartphone. Yeah. Which is amazing, and uh, we don't know for sure whether they still make CDs or not. Well, you know what's even weirder, here though? On, here on Almond in the morning. <laughs> it sounds like a CD actually sounds much more antiquated mm -hmm. than album does for some reason. I don't know why, but... Just I don't the know. Idea I, thought, I thought album sounded pretty antiquated <laughs> when you said it. <laughs> hey, so it was uh, Old Home Week. Before we start talking about some uh, issues, it was Old Home Week yesterday. I got a story to tell you about Senator Bond. I had the privilege of hosting my brother's son's graduation party. He graduated from Washington. My, my brother's from uh, D.C. And his in-laws... Uh, who uh, are are dear friends of Senator Bond's, mm -hmm. and they actually mm -hmm. stayed at Senator Bond's house. Oh, really? Uh, for, for over the weekend, and so um, I had them send a note to Senator Bond uh, to him, and in return, my brother brought back the next day. Senator Bond sent me one of his old 1972 uh, political buttons. You know? Really? Yeah. He is a great guy, and I have so much respect for him. And the story I was telling my in-laws was when I was a kid, I had a fort, and I built this fort on the side of my house. And I kept the wood together using bumper stickers. Uh -huh. So I had so and and actually because my dad was you know Republican and everything else back in the day that we had all we had the Ashcroft stickers we had the Bond stickers we had Danforth stickers everything else right and I used these stickers to patch together my my fort I wish I had a picture uh -huh, of it but yeah. because I was the sixth kid there are no actual pictures, pictures of me of you, yeah but <laughs> exactly. but still. Um, I wish I had a picture. And so last night you get together, and, you, and I saw this picture on Renee Hulse's uh, Facebook page. It's you, Senator Danforth, uh, Senator Bond, uh, Kenny Holsoff. And Senator Ashcroft. Senator Ashcroft. Right. All your bumper stickers are almost All there. my bumper stickers are there. If you just had a blunt and a whole soft bumper sticker, it would have been your childhood <laughs> yeah, right, right there. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it was just, I mean, it, but what a great picture. And you guys all look great, by the way. So probably a ton of fun, too, huh? Well, you know those are those those guys have served our state so well, and and Kit Bond is a particularly bright, hardworking guy. Yeah, and, uh, he's always loved to work, served, and is because of that. Following him in the Senate was a pretty big challenge. The good news is I love to work too, so <laughs> right. I can right. sort of keep up with the love to work part. Whether I can keep up with how smart Senator Bond is, who has almost a photographic memory. Yeah, uh, and is you know. Is uh, really uh, been a great uh, guy serving our state and still doing some things to help with the military bases here and other things and the work he's continuing to do. But it was it was great to be with uh, all of them last night at a nice event. Uh, yeah. At the Bond's house for me. And I know Senator Talent was going to be there, or, or Brenda was there, but yeah, I actually right. ran into Senator Talent's son last night at the Young Republicans event. That they was had this Michael? Him. Michael, who just got accepted to Stanford. Right. Right. So Michael I mean, helped me in the uh, Senate campaign uh, five years ago, and he was he, he could do anything. He could do anything. He he would if you said Michael, we need somebody to empty the waste cans. That was fine. If we said Michael, we need somebody to do a video. Right. He was he's a very talented kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good kid. And, and I guess they figured that out at Stanford. <laughs> yeah, they sure they certainly <laughs> right. did. I mean, that's right. a pretty good uh, that's a pretty good uh, uh, place for him. That's for sure. Yeah. So you were in town yesterday. 
uh, to make an announcement. What was that? Well, I was at um, I was at uh, the federally qualified uh, clinic at uh, Affinia, which has changed the name. The Grace Hill Clinics changed their name recently. And talking about uh, what's happening there, we were able in uh, a piece of legislation recently not only to eliminate uh, an annual embarrassment of acting like we were going to pay for something by cutting Medicare doctor payments, which 18 times in 10 years the Congress said, hey, we really – this is really not a smart thing to do. Finally, the Congress was able to say, look, this is such a silly thing to do. We're going to quit acting like every year this is ever going to happen. But in doing that, we were also able uh, to keep the uh, federally qualified clinics from going off a cliff that had been created uh, in the president's health care plan uh, that would have uh, reduced their the money available to those federally qualified clinics by almost uh, two billion dollars a year and and I think Jamie the clinics provide the medical home for lots of people and are never really factored in to whether people have access to health care or not because you know the federally qualified clinics you go there and if you have insurance they take your insurance if you have uh, medicare or medicaid they take that if you don't have anything you pay on a sliding scale based on how much income you have and i think everybody pays a little something because frankly i think you value something more if you pay for it than if you don't but you basically if you, if you can't afford to pay anything you basically don't have to pay anything for that to be uh, your medical home and like at the uh, one location i I was at yesterday about 45,000 people a year last year 45,000 people use that clinic as opposed to the emergency room or something else so the federally qualified clinics I think are a good thing um, the other thing I was able to talk about yesterday is some legislation I got passed uh, last year with Senator Stabenow from Michigan where in eight pilot states and hopefully Missouri will be one of them uh, the federal government will be a payer for mental health, behavioral health, like any other health problem. And we're way behind just realizing as a society that this is a health problem that ought to be treated like a health problem. There's no reason to have one category uh, for uh, a, a, another kind of health problem. But for mental health, no, we, we can only pay just a little bit to solve that. And frankly, I'm convinced that uh, you know, most, most people with a mental health challenge and NIH, the National Institute of Health, says one out of four adult Americans has a diagnosable and almost treatable mental health, uh, behavioral health problem. Uh, and um, almost all of those people, particularly if they have a severe mental health problem, they have other health problems as well. But if you get that mental health problem under control, people start sleeping better, eating better, seeing their doctor, taking their medicine for whatever else they have. And before you know it, the physical health problem is costing so much to pay for is much easier to deal with. So I'm I'm pleased to be part of that discussion of what we do to really treat mental health um, like we should. And one other number I'll give you on that. Uh, the National Institute of Health also says that like one out of nine adult Americans has a behavioral health problem that severely impacts their daily life. And so I guess this would affect veterans too, right? Uh, absolutely. Oh, and when we exactly, and when we introduced excellence in mental health, of course, the, the law enforcement community, a huge supporter of that, uh, who in many cases have become sort of the mental health uh, fallback position in the country, the law enforcement, the normal uh, mental health advocates, but the veterans groups, and particularly the young veterans groups, who want to have more choices. They want to be able to stop at a. a, a properly qualified mental health or community health clinic near where they live instead of have to drive three hours to get mental health treatment at a VA facility somewhere. The young veterans groups, generally uh, several of them made excellence in mental health their top or one of their top legislative priorities as we spent two years trying to get that passed and did. All right. When we come back, I want to ask you also about the uh, trade deal and uh, how okay. you feel about that. All right. Stick around, right? I can stay for a little while. I'll be glad right. to talk. All right. Senator All in blood. the morning. Common Sense Radio. Blood. Return in a second. Senator Blood, if I may compliment your staff. Yep. I see my staff doesn't mind to be complimented. So that, <laughs> I'm seeing a uh, little news release here. Blunt makes more than 1,000 stops visiting with Missourians since joining the Senate. And I just went on a rant earlier this week about this over versus more than thing. And I would like to compliment your staff on being excellent grammarians. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. 
Good for that. Good. Uh, but the news is, was were you in your Scooby van? Is that how you made all these? <laughs> 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 no, I don't have a Scooby van, but I did make those stops. And you know, I, I, I got to every county within the first couple of years and before I knew it I'd almost gotten to every county again without even having that as a goal and I said well let's just let's just finish that up as we uh, uh, as, as we as we get our work done because it does help you know I, I don't know how many events I've done here in the city of St. Louis probably 50 to 100 of those thousand events were right here but when you get everywhere in the state you do have a greater sense of what people are doing and you sit down with people and talk to people about uh, their their hopes and their goals and their concern a lot of concern right now about federal regulations on uh, what's going to happen to our utility bills what's going to happen to if the EPA does in fact successfully get control of all the water in the country uh, but uh, you know it's Missouri's a great and interesting state and being all over it is a is a opportunity that not very many people have and and I've actually been in every county three times in the last six years because I went to every county during the campaign as well and now uh, twice for official events uh, in the last four years and a couple of months. How fun was it to be at Redneck Blinds in Lamar, Missouri? <laughs> <That's laughs> you know, awesome. Redneck Blinds are pretty fun. They, yeah. uh, here's a guy, you know, again, you just as a Missourian figures out, okay, here's something I can do. Uh, that's There's a market niche here. For hunt, they're hunt, hunting blinds, you know, is what redneck yeah. blinds is, uh, and you know they've got some, uh, they've got some uh, blinds that look like big round bales of hay, and they've got uh, 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 deer stands that uh, that are do what deer stands do, yeah. and you know just. It, there are lots of things in our state that are fun to see. Good for you. So now, uh, tell me about this trade deal, the Pacific trade deal. What, what, what's your opinion about this, and and how how is your support or not? not well, I'm, I'm I'm inclined to be supportive of trade. We haven't seen the Pacific trade uh, agreement yet, and frankly, until the president had the TPA authority, the trade promotion authority that we gave the president uh, in the last few days, you're, you're never going to get the best deal until the people on the other side of the table know that this is real. This is not uh, just an exercise they're going through to see how far they'll go, but this is real. Every president since, so the only thing we've done so far is give President Obama trade promotion authority, which means uh, a trade agreement will be voted on yes or no. Uh, by the Congress of the United States. Every president since Franklin Roosevelt has had TPA, Trade Promotion Authority, until Barack Obama. Uh, and in his first term, he didn't even ask for it. Uh, in the second term, he asked for it, but then it was pretty clear he didn't really want it until after the, uh, the off-year election. And now finally, with just a little over a year left, he finally has something that every president's had, hopefully also has a desire to break down these barriers to our products. Right. And what I like about trade generally, Jamie, and everybody listening won't agree on this, uh, but I, I think the facts bear this out, is we have very low barriers to everybody else's products. Many of these countries have very high barriers to our products, particularly agricultural products. Uh, and um, if you can lower those barriers, we are incredibly competitive. Uh, and you know, as I've said here before, let's talk about agriculture for a minute. So world food needs are going to double between now and 2070. But we are standing right in the middle of the biggest piece of contiguous agricultural ground in the world, the Mississippi River Valley. It's got the best farmers, the best ranchers, the best ag research institutions, public and private. And we're also standing not too far away from the greatest artery of commerce uh, for that market, the Mississippi River. Uh, for, for us, we're in a place where uh, an economy that grows things, an economy that makes things, has great access to the world if we take advantage of that access. Uh, and I think Missouri will be particularly benefited by opening up that Trans-Pacific market uh, to our products, some of which will have lots of value added, some of which, even if even if uh, those products go as live animals or just harvested grain, that means you've got to build the facilities to make all that happen. And so an economy that grows things and makes things also is an economy that builds things, and that market will be particularly good uh, for our state. Well, and frankly, I'm glad to hear that. I think a lot of uh, our listeners are as well because, you know, this is one thing – you know, Obama seems to be getting right when it comes to the specific trade agreement. If, if indeed you guys, we and when once you see it, but it well, sounds if we like see it and itself. it really breaks down those barriers, it also will 
will bring that part of the world into the orbit of where you do business uh, it, b b based on the rule of law and e equity of relationships. And that whole part of the world will develop differently than if we let the Chinese and the Russians, who have a much more cynical, much more colonial view of trade, be the ones that determine the future of that part of the world. So hopefully they'll negotiate a great deal. And if they do, I'll be for it. If they don't, I won't. But if it's a great deal, it'll be great for exactly where you and I live. Yeah, it's interesting. It's another one of these things, though, too, that... that um the, the, there's a desire to pass it before you actually see it. And even though, you know, we, we've been there, done that before, but but at least uh, it looks like the path seems uh, right. Well, now they finally have the final tool they need to get the best deal from the Japanese and others. And if they don't get it, we shouldn't vote for the deal. But if they do, they now finally have what they need to say, okay, this is now serious. Let's get down. And remember, the uh, Japanese prime minister spoke to the joint session of Congress not too long ago. And maybe to everybody's surprise, said we're going to allow more agricultural products from the United States to come to Japan, which has been a big barrier for us with that marketplace for a long time. Missouri pork producers, Missouri cattle raisers, uh, and uh, our, our grain farmers all would benefit. Senator Roy Blunt, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much for stopping in. Great to be here. We'll be following you on Twitter and the rest. Good luck to you, buddy. KMTK HD1.